dear all, <clears throat> on behalf of the Open Air Advance team, uh, I would like to welcome you to this um, info session in the frame of uh, our Open Air Advance Open Call for Tenders. The aim of the session is to give you an overview of the open air topics, to explain to you certain technical characteristics, and to answer your questions related to technical or strategic issues. My name is Irin Karachristou. Today we'll manage the discussion so as um, to conclude uh, the presentation within our timeline. Um, since I presented to you the scope of our meeting, we will proceed with uh, the presentation of Mrs. Uh, Natalia Manola, Research Associate at Athena Research and Innovation Center. She will present to us the Open Air Advance, a long-term strategy. At the, at the second stage, we will proceed with the presentation of the topics. And uh, at the end um, of the presentation, we will listen to additional comments by our technical experts. Last but not least, in order to conclude this session, I will give you an overview of the most crucial points of the Open Air uh, Advance Open Call for Tenders. The meeting will be completed with a roundtable discussion where you as potential applicants may address your questions related to technical and strategic issues. If you don't have already some questions, I will leave the floor to Mrs. Natalia Manola. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, Irene, thank you for uh, introducing me. Uh, this is, uh, I would just, I would not go very uh, deep into the strategic. Uh, I think uh, many of you know where open air comes from and where we want to go to. So I will just give uh, uh, three or four points. So as you all know, open air advance is a project, the Horizon 2020 European project. Uh, I think it's the fourth in the row since uh, 2009 that we started. Uh, and this is, uh, it has uh, the strategic priorities are, are three. Mainly is to uh, produce, uh, to, to empower the, na the national open access desks uh, network that we have, which is a network in every European country, a representative organization in every European country, fostering open access to publications, data, other research works, and uh, open science in general. The second strategic priority is training, how to uh, build uh, the training, um, a training infrastructure in Europe uh, to foster this open science. And training is around many issues. It's a training about policies, training is about um, um, research data management, it's about open access to publications, it's all about it. And then third and uh, third is the services, and this is where we come in. Uh, so from the from the start of, from the beginning of, of open air, we have a service oriented infrastructure. Uh, we have a, a list of services that you can uh, browse through in the catalog.openair.eu, you can reach it from our site, and we have different services services that are addressing uh, content providers. So for example, we have services for repositories and open access journals, uh, how to register and validate the metadata schema into open air and be visible to Europe and the world. Uh, we have services, uh, again, for content providers, how to exchange metadata through the broker system. Uh, we have services for the researchers which are mainly uh, the, the Zenodo uh, repository at CERN. We have Amnesia, which is an anonymization service. We now uh, are releasing Argos, which is a data management plan, uh, serv uh, plan service. And we have services also that uh, foster this, uh, this uh, exchange of information like Skol Exploring Skolix, which is the uh, which is the data to literature integration. And probably I'm forgetting some, uh, but this is, uh, and of course, last but not least that Paolo will be talking about is the open air research graph that we're trying to build a scholarly communication graph uh, with um, participants around uh, the world, with collaborators around the world. So as you have seen, I think maybe for the second time is that the aim 
uh, as an infrastructure, we cover from 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 the layer from the universities to the to our to the value added services for uh, uh, for research communities, for funders, for uh, everyone who wants to uh, do something in scholarly communication. So our three challenges is about uh, how to empower. The challenge number one is next uh, generation repositories is how can we have services that we cannot do ourselves, but we can um, empower repository platforms like uh, ePrints, DSpace, now Lyrasis, uh, and other uh, repository platforms in order to for them to, uh, to, to come to the next level, what we call the next generation repositories. There is a core uh, listing of new functionalities uh, that uh, we would like to delve into. Then the second topic is um, on value-added products for open science. And I think this is based mainly on, on the graph that we are producing. How can somebody uh, take a graph and produce uh, value-added services for various stakeholders? And this could be from researchers. You now, for example, how can I get uh, my CV based on that? To funders, uh, proper monitoring. To research communities, how to publish. And then the third challenge is um, uh, the enhancement of current uh, services and technology of open air, because of open air is 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 a data infrastructure, a big data infrastructure. We take uh, millions of contents around the world. We uh, metadata and also data or uh, text. Uh, we text and data mine. We duplicate. We clean. Uh, we we use APIs. So. There is a lot of machinery on the back of open air and uh, services that would uh, make it um, make it uh, more robust or more performant would be uh, very welcome. And all of this, uh, I have to say, is in uh, is in the in the remit of the European Open Science Cloud that many of you have heard. So open air um, uh, is a pillar of the European Open Sci uh, Science Cloud. Uh, um, the word I'm trying strengthening the open science. This is the work that I, I was looking for, strengthening open science and uh, working with research infrastructures, uh, big data or small research infrastructures, that how to make this, you know, this uh, publishing workflow uh, start from day one and then how to make uh, data discovery for them or how to make uh, data more visible for them. And this is because because this is a European infrastructure, and in in in, in the course of the European uh, projects, we are not able to um, to fund SMEs uh, for particular tasks because that would mean that we give a preference to particular SMEs or particular solutions. This is why we have the open calls because we want all of you to uh, to to come and and work with us or and see what what you can offer and this is uh this is uh, i think our aim thank you natalia for this uh, fruitful presentation of the open air advanced long term strategy scope and activities um are there any questions at this uh, point Okay, if not, then uh, I think that we can proceed with topic one, next generation repositories. Uh, Johan, if uh, you are ready, I will uh, share the presentation that you sent me earlier with uh, the participants. Okay. Is it uh, clear? Okay. Uh, you can tell me when um, you want me to proceed to the next slide. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, good morning. Uh, my name is Jochen Schürwagen from Bielefeld University, um, <clears throat> part of the technical team in open air, and among other tasks responsible uh, for a work package called um, <clears throat> Towards Scholarly Commons. And part of this work package is on next generation repositories. However, the, the idea of um, 
next generation repositories was born in the context of the um, a core organization confer confederation of open access repositories um, a working group was initiated in 2016 and uh, this was done for a couple of reasons and on the next slide um, so for instance the crisis of um, the institutional and institutional repositories um, some aspects are of course also valid um, for catch-all or disciplinary repositories um, but sometimes some aspects are also different um, so <clears throat> here are two examples um, already three years um, ago published that criticizes institutional repositories regarding pure usability for instance um, because there is a very heterogeneous landscape um, that um, lack of agreement on, on common um, and standards and um, this makes it uh, often a challenge um, to aggregate uh, not only the metadata but also um, the digital objects uh, in a high quality way. Um, then another aspect um, often criticized now is um, the protocol or IPMH to collect um, metadata records um, while this um, was um, a promising approach um, in the uh, by the uh, beginning of, of the 2000 years um, as a common denominator um, interchange protocol for repositories it is now no longer um, up to date um, due to other more modern web standards and to issues regarding um, lack of support of other formats than XML because of performance issues, content application and so on. Moreover, um, the repositories in general um, have a um, <coughs> difficult role. Um, on the one side, um, they are the backbone of the open access community of open access infrastructures like open air. Um, they are used to fulfill several um, open access mandates by uh, funders, um, most recently the Plan S for instance. Um, however, um, they are not well acknowledged by, by researchers, uh, especially institutional repositories, um, because they have not the same um, priority like um, the paper in a scientific journal. And usually a repository is not a virtual place where, where uh, re researchers would uh, meet. Um, going to the next slide, um, there are some aspects um, that need to be improved. Um, one of them is a limitation in, in functionalities. Repositories are often acting as uh, data silos. Um, there are only a few global aggregators like Open Air, like Base, like uh, Core, um, like La, La Referencia. But mainly um, the issues are a lack of uh, social um, interaction functionalities and issues in regarding technical interoperability. On the next slide, we will see that um, now the core next generation repositories vision comes into place. Um, which asks to position repositories as a foundation for distributed globally networked infrastructure for scholarly communication. And here it is um, important to build um, value added services on top of these um, repository infrastructures. Another aspect is also that in the past repositories were seen as um, the object um, <coughs> where the interaction would take place. However, more important is to make the resource that is deposited in the repository um, as <coughs> the priority entity in the web to make it interactive to, um, to machines on the one side, but also um, to, to researchers and to the public. On the next side, slide, there are some um, challenges mentioned. Um, so one set is to build um, value added services, um, but also to better integrate repositories in the research life cycle and to build innovative scholarly services on top of repositories. And also the 
operation aspect is important um, <clears throat> to make sure that repositories are collectively managed by scholarly communities and not uh, by a few um, monopolies in, <clears throat> in the world. Improving repository functionality um, means to make the resources, meaning the digital objects, an integral part um, of the web. Um, very important here is also to uh, standardize the um, data exchange on a global scale and to by adoption of modern web standards and protocols. And in the end, it's important not only to um, support um, literature or research data or software, but any kind of, of digital re research results in repositories. The next slide identifies <coughs> several um, behaviors of next generation repositories, um, which are recommended by these um, working group uh, in core. Um, these behaviors are a result of um, collecting several um, use cases and also by collecting feedback um, from the repository community. I don't want to go <coughs> through all of these 11 um, behaviors. Give me. I'm sorry, I had a problem with my connection. I couldn't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I think that we maybe solved it. Uh, okay, I'm still in uh, this slide. Um, <coughs> okay, so how does I would right, so you could hear everything. Okay, okay I um, see then... I'm sorry. It was, uh, I don't know, it was maybe the internet. <laughs> no problem. So, um, in a project like Open Air Advance, um, we cannot cover, of course, all the mentioned um, behaviors. So, we uh, selected a couple of them and concentrated on resource discovery and batch content transfer, open metrics, and annotation of content. Um, on the next slide, uh, and with regard to um, these call for tenders. Could you move to the next slide, please? Um, we propose um, several activities. Of course, this list is not, not complete, um, just a uh, few ideas, um, meaning that we uh, would suggest um, more software platforms that um, support um, modern standards like resource sync and signposting. Um, which of course makes sense to implement in platforms that are uh, mainly used in, in the repository world, uh, which is, for instance, DSpace 5 and DSpace 6, but also um, ePrints and, and also um, several <coughs> derivatives of, of Fedora, for instance. Um, we also suggest to build on the current open air usage statistics service in open air with regard to more innovative um, visualization um, techni techniques, um, which would allow a better analysis of usage um, of resources and from um, the data sources. On the next slide, um, I will suggest um, a little bit more in detail um, some use cases. So starting um, with the issue that, um, for instance, OpenAI can collect um, bibliographic metadata records um, from uh, over 2,500 uh, data sources. Um, on the other side, the, the issue since the beginning is to uh, uniquely identify um, the full text in the metadata records. And, and here, the resource sync could come into play and a scenario is visualized in the figure um, implemented by Core in the UK uh, using resource sync, which collects metadata and the full text from, from publishers and makes 
um, these links available for synchronization um, with with other um, service services and open air is already um, using it, it uh, by implementing a resource sync client and, and collecting metadata and, and full text um, from publishers, open access publishers via core. The next slide um, suggests the implementation um, and, and uh, scenarios based on signposting um, to discover and navigate um, content on, on landing pages um, by help of typed links in, in HTTP link headers. Um, <clears throat> so this is a rather, um, I would say, low-level approach um, where, for instance, the HTTP header um, of a web resource is analyzed and, and the links contained in the header um, are evaluated um, by help of their relation and, and, and their type. So, for instance, I get immediately information um, how to cite these particular resource. Um, I get information how I, on, <coughs> on citation formats like, like BibTeX, I get information in which um, format I could um, access um, the resource. Uh, let it be a zip file or let it be a specific format like PDF or HTML. And I get information of identifiers related to the authors that created the resource. Another example concerns the user statistics. Um, <coughs> Open Air already um, collects usage events um, and, and counter reports uh, from over 150 data sources. It provides a simple visualization um, on, on the repository level and on the item level in the OpenAI portal. However, it would um, be interesting to, um, <coughs> to build more uh, kinds of visualization based on, on, on user statistics um, and provide filters um, th that are built on different aggregate, aggregation levels using different parameters like on the repository level, on the item level, um, but also user statistics that can be compared by topic or discipline, by geographical region. And also um, interesting would be um, to analyze user statistics in relation with other kinds of centimetric indicators. The last example is <clears throat> the annotation of content, um, where now already since two years, um, web standard um, is defined, um, the W3C web annotation standard. And this is an interesting idea that um, could improve um, implementations for open peer review um, where a reviewer is able to annotate the content of a, that was created by by another person and to make these annotations um, visible um, yeah using well-established standards coming to the um, selection criteria um, Regarding this topic, it's entirely important to align with the existing open air interoperability standards, namely the open air guidelines for content providers, which um, exist for different types of sources like repositories, journals, CRIS systems, um, but also for different kinds of resource types like um, textual publications, research data, software, and other research products. Another selection criteria is the level of innovation. So it would be interesting um, not only to see just the implementation uh, of one of the suggested protocols, but also concrete um, demonstrations or prototypes that showcase how these new standards um, can be used um, to improve behavior of repositories. And finally, improve the scholarly communication. And of course, um, 
the proposals should also have an impact on the existing open air services and last but not least on its stakeholders okay thank you thank you very much uh your hand for this presentation um and i'm sorry for the earlier inconvenience uh, due to the internet connection. There is one question, uh, if the presentations will be available after the webinar. I believe that our presenters will be willing to share their presentations. W would it be feasible? Go ahead. Um, yes, I think this is the idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, okay, uh, Let's um, let's proceed with the presentations of Paolo for topics two and three, and then uh, the, particip the participants may gather um, their questions in total, and maybe we can discuss uh, uh, the different issues. Uh, Paolo, you will have 30 minutes to present uh, topics uh, two and three, and um, I can uh, make you a presenter if you want to share us uh, to share with us your screen. Mm, yes, please. Okay. Uh, please give me one minute. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, so in this presentation, I have to go through uh, a long list uh, of, detail, of services that we're building in open air. So um, since we don't have much time, I um, preferred, I opted uh, for an in-depth description on what we call the uh, open air resource graph, and then uh, a more lightweight, uh, let's say, level of detail with respect to other services that were built on top of the graph. So first of all, let me try, let me start with uh, a general introduction of what we're doing uh, today in open air. So uh, technically speaking, we are building um, a large collection of metadata, metadata records describing um, all, all, let's say, uh, kind of entities you can find in the um, scholarly communication record, so ranging from metadata about publications, data, software, etc., cetera, uh, to uh, metadata that you, uh, of entities that you uh, would rather use to monitor uh, research impact or uh, uh, provides a scientific reward to your institutions and scientists, such as uh, uh, affiliation information, so organization, uh, funder information, uh, project information linked to funder, um, uh, also the data sources from which we collect the information and so on. So we build basically uh, a graph, what we call the open air resource graph. So the first thing that we do in that direction is to collect from uh, external data sources. We strongly rely on the uh, uh, repositories that are today providing uh, storage and the position and pers persistence to all the results of science, as Jochen was suggesting. So those repositories are out there today. They already contain metadata and files uh, regarding these objects. And uh, other sources out there are already improving content from repositories by aggregating them, harmonizing them, providing links where these were not available, enriching them with information uh, that was not originally available, and uh, therefore providing uh, use cases and applications that are specific to certain contexts. For example, Unpaywall collects cross-ref and identifies the open access uh, link, the, sorry, the links to open access versions of the articles in Crossref, and that's a very useful operation to do. So what we do in OpenAir is to collect all such sources. Uh, we provide also guidelines, uh, as, Joachim, as Joachim mentioned. Um, these guidelines are basically um, instructions uh, for data uh, source managers to export metadata in a homogeneous, as much as possible homogeneous way to simplify the process of collection and uh, aggregation. Uh, these, these guidelines are not 
available for all kinds of sources. Of course, in several cases, uh, we need to uh, take on board on our shooter the harmonization process. So, to give you an example, we collect, for example, from Orchid, data side, uh, we uh, collect from uh, open access publishers, from ag aggregators of open, of open access publishers like DOAJ, and so on. Uh, as a specific use case, we also collect from research infrastructure sources. And this is quite uh, new uh, with respect to the general uh, context of scholarly communication. And that's because uh, we believe that there are many data sources that live today in the context of specific scientific uh, research infrastructures, for example, Partinos, uh, EPOS, et cetera, that contain objects that are useful. Uh, for science, both in terms of reproducibility of science itself, for example, the workflows used to perform a given experiment, uh, and in terms of attribution of the scientists uh, who've been uh, producing them. Uh, because, of course, we need to attribute these products to the scientists, it's been part of their effort and their skills. So, when we collect these metadata records, uh, we build a graph uh, whose uh, high level data model is depicted here. Uh, you see the product is at the center and we have different classes of products which are publications intended as uh, literature stuff so thing the objects digital objects that uh, are intended to be read by humans um, data which is um, basically collections of, of objects that are intended to be processed by software or at most to be observed by humans to uh, uh, represent facts and observations and software which is instead the code that we either compile or interpret to execute uh, a process over the data, possibly. And then we have this ORP. ORP stays for uh, other research products. It's basically any kind of research project that doesn't fall in the first three categories, which can be easily recognized and identified across different disciplines, while ORP ORPs tend to be very specific to the different disciplines. And this is where uh, we ask our scientists to um, uh, let's say uh, uh, classify their objects. For each project, we for each product, but in fact for each object in the graph, we uh, track the original source from which we collected the metadata, and uh, we can link it uh, to projects, funding, organizations, and funder when the information exists within uh, the original metadata. As we, as you know, uh, if you're part of this domain, uh, this is the case and it's becoming the case between uh, when links between publications and research data are provided, but it's not necessarily the case uh, in all the other scenarios. For example, uh, the links to the projects are not often available, the links to the organizations are generally not provided, and uh, links between publications uh, um, um, and software or data and software are not generally available. So this is why we manipulate this metadata in several ways. Uh, in, on, on the one side, we uh, clean and validate, uh, uh, we validate the original sources to, to check if they respect to the guidelines. On the other side, we clean it to compensate um, these uh, lack of compliance to our guidelines, so harmonize uh, our content where these exist. Uh, we perform the duplication which means that uh, if we find records describing the same uh, digital object but coming from different sources, we identify these two records and we blend them together, keeping track, of course, of both the original sources or more than two. If this is the case. We have products whose metadata can be collected from tens of, of sources. And uh, uh, we also perform inference. Inference is mining here. So we are, when possible, collecting the original file. When possible means uh, when the URL is correctly provided or we can infer it and the method and the file it's open access. We collect the PDFs. So we have around 12 million PDFs today, on top of which we run uh, mining algorithms to detect missing links. Most of the time, missing links between these objects, especially projects pro products uh, or product software, etc. Uh, on top of this graph, we build and we offer a number of uh, applications. Uh, this application should be interpreted as a way of looking at the graph, so different views, different views of the graph. In some, in some cases, we want to use the graph to monitor how science uh, 
or open science is being performed in one community or another community or across community or with respect to a, fu uh, a funder, for example, point of view, or with respect to an organization. In other cases, instead, we want to offer uh, discovery mechanisms uh, to a scientist of a specific context, for example, so to view this graph from the, from the perspective of their own science, so the projects related with the science, the products related with the science, um, uh, the links that are concerned and uh, related with these products, and so on. Uh, so basically, the system is divided in five parts. Uh, bottom left you see the aggregation so there's a whole aggregation system through which we collect the metadata records and uh, the files when these are available um, these metadata records are cleansed here and then they are uh, used to generate what we call a native graph um, so basically these records are unwrapped and uh, a native graph is built out of them we are collecting today 500 million records roughly and uh, around uh, it's 900 million links, directed links. So if you consider bilateral, bidirectional, it's about 480 million. So we build a graph out of that. And uh, as you can see at the top, we can slice the graph. So we take it from the different uh, entities point of view. So we can take, for example, the publications or the data sets or the organizations, and we perform the duplication. As the feedback of this action, the graph is then revised in order to merge the equivalent objects and build a deduped graph. And this deduped graph can be finally enriched with the results of mining, which are uh, bottom right. The results of mining uh, take a copy of the deduped graph, take uh, populate a full text cache where we run the algorithms. And as a result of this, we obtain a number of updates to the graph, uh, which we store into action sets. Action sets uh, uh, allow us to structure uh, the way the inferred information is produced. So we have an action set for links between publications and links, an action set for the abstracts that we have found, etc. And so we enrich the graph uh, accordingly. Once we finalize the graph, so we build the enriched version, then we publish it. And we publish it via different uh, uh, backends. These backends range from uh, linked open data to a full text index to dumps uh, to uh, OEI PMH uh, endpoint. Okay. Uh, the index is then, of course, serving our applications, which are connect, explore, uh, uh, monitor, etc., and uh, um, can be used, of course, by others uh, to build their own applications and services. Okay. Um, so all this is performed using um, several kinds of open source technologies. Um, we uh, we use uh, Spark a lot, uh, Hadoop, of course, the whole Hadoop stack to produce this graph and manipulate it. But I mean, standard technologies have been used like Mongo, MongoDB to store the metadata. Uh, and uh, um, especially DNet. DNet is a framework that is not mentioned here that we have built internally to manage workflows. So all the workflows you've seen are uh, 80, let's I would say 80% performed automatically by the system. Then, of course, you need humans to uh, verify that at the end uh, everything went fine. For example, the fine monitoring that all the indexing procedure was completed uh, properly it has to be uh, double checked by a human. Um, uh, resources. We run all this into a dev, a beta, and production uh, organized like system. And uh, in production, we have uh, a public system, what we call a public system, which is uh, the place where we store, there are double numbers here, okay, the place where we store um, uh, and provide uh, the portals, the mining system where, of course, uh, as it uh, self-explanatory <laughs> uh, claims, is where we run our algorithms. Uh, mining algorithms and the data provision is where we keep the graph and we build it, so we enrich it, uh, we deduplicate it, and so on. I'm sorry about the double numbers here. You will have the slides. This was just to highlight an increase. Uh, it's a slide uh, that highlighted an increase in the, the last year of the resources and somehow screwed. 
So we have around 40 people working uh, at five different locations on this system. So, and on different aspects of it, ranging from the UIs to the mining uh, algorithms, the cluster and the organization of the, of the mining algorithms themselves, which is separate from it. So how to, for example, uh, execute mining algorithms and plug in my mining algorithms in our system to uh, the operation and data curation uh, aspects, uh, etc. So you can imagine how complex it is. So the open air resource graph, um, the way we built it, I mentioned it before, so we collect uh, through what we call provide. Uh, it's, a, it's a system that allows us to validate, uh, register the sources, collect the content, provide statistics about them, and so on. Um, we uh, further enrich the graph thanks to end user feedback. So end users can come through our portal and uh, portals and add links to the graph to make it better, for example. So they can link products to projects, product to uh, communities, etc. We do the duplication and the mining, as mentioned before, and in the end, we publish via the applications. Uh, the, open air graph, the open air resource graph is therefore at the center. So we want to provide this uh, open metadata collection. We want it to be open. That's key, very important. Uh, in some cases, uh, it could also it can also be CC0. In other cases, it cannot because we collect from sources that are not CC0, like Microsoft, Microsoft Academic Graphs, for example. We want it to be complete as possible, uh, meaning that we want all trusted data sources to be in, trusted by the community, of course, so sources that they consider uh, reliable for them, for their science. Uh, we want it to be deduplicated. We want it to be transparent, which means uh, we want to track down where each piece of the information comes from. So if we mine, uh, for example, a subject and we infer a subject out of a full text, we want to know that this subject was inferred, wasn't collected from a repository. And we want also to know uh, the level of trust of every single piece of information. So we identified an internal framework um, that classifies trust of uh, information from zero to one. And we uh, require all our algorithms to produce a level of uh, intended trust. And uh, we assign it to every bit. So you can actually view the graph from different trust perspectives. So you can see, for example, all objects uh, and interlinked objects with a given level of trust or below or beyond, etc. Uh, we want it to be decentralized. And that's uh, the, the idea that this graph should, is today surviving in open air, but we want this information, especially the ones, the information enriching the data sources out there to be stored in the data sources out there. So we provide tools for that to happen. We call it the broker service. So through the broker service, a data source provides us content and can actually get, collect back uh, all the content that we have found that then reaches the original records, okay? And they can subscribe and be notified of different kinds of enrichments. This is actually very important for us because open air, we hope it will exist for ages and provide this service. Uh, but if at some point this will end, we want this precious information that we found uh, thanks to this participatory effort to be stored forever. Okay, that's very important. Okay, um, this is just a, a glimpse of some of the 10,000 sources that we're uh, collecting from, but consider we go from GitHub, Software Heritage, to uh, all the registries like Grid, R3Data, Open Door, Orchid, uh, to the um, thematic repositories, uh, the catch-all repositories like Zenodo, B2Share, uh, uh, Dryad, uh, Figshare, and so on, to the research infrastructures, which are top right in this screen, okay? Um, so the harvesting and transformation workflows. Uh, the idea is that we have services uh, that are organized into uh, workflows. Workflows are made of sub-workflows. That's the framework that we built. And uh, we split it in uh, collection phases, transformation phases. So for us, it's actually very important to track down every single step in this process. So um, track down when this was performed, so when we have collected, when it was done, if it failed, uh, which are the records that were uh, not accepted, and the same uh, on the transformation side. We want to know which are the clean record, how many of those failed to clean, and so on. So for us, it's uh, very important to uh, track down this process. Um, 
key also, for example, to define the, 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 the transformation mappings. Uh, so we need to have the native sources under control to check if uh, all the vocabularies they're used, which are highly heterogeneous, uh, uh, find uh, a mapping into our common model through the transformation, for example. Okay, so here there are several things uh, that we are doing. We are moving from the XML to the, to the JSON framework. Um, that's an unfortunate heritage that we have because XML was uh, the core language into the OEI PMH, and that's where we stood for a long time. And so we are moving uh, from XSLT to JSON and XML to JSON at the same time. Uh, we need to monitor the data and quality expectations across the sources, within sources. Um, uh, so for us, again, it's important to track provenance and to do something nice with it, for example, identifying statistics, uh, verify that, for example, uh, over time, a data source um, is increasingly uh, improving in quality or is, in, is increasing the number of records, because if at some point we realize that there's half of the records there, some errors, uh, may have occurred, and that's a problem for us, which are building an aggregation. So we need to keep things under control. Uh, we do a fine grain uh, classification of the resource products. So uh, when we collect from a repository or a data source in general, we don't consider it uh, to be uh, a container of objects of the same class, like all publications, all data sets, all software. We consider them hybrid. So we do these classifications into our common model with a fine grain. Uh, uh, methodology. So we check the original resource type and we find every time a mapping into one of the meta classes we have in open air, so publication data software and other resource products, and a, pos a possible subclass if it exists. So uh, important for us is that we are collecting from 10,000 sources, but uh, some of them uh, we um, pre, let's say, pre-aggregate them, especially the largest one. So we have two pre-processed sources which we really strongly rely on. One is Skull Explorer and the other one is DOI Boost. Uh, Skull Explorer is a collection of article data set links that we collect from Datasite, uh, Crossref and Emboli BI. This means that we are collecting basically everything that is a trusted link between data set and articles out there. Um, we are collecting today overall 480 million links uh, by direction, as I mentioned before. Um, we uh, do the same with respect to Crossref. Crossref is a key uh, source and we want to have its richest version. So we, we built what is called DOI Boost. Uh, it's basically an intersection between Crossref, Unpaywall, Microsoft Academics and ORCID. Okay. As a result of this, we have 85 million publication records complete of all possible ORCID IDs, all possible open access versions, all possible links to affiliations, uh, uh, abstracts and subjects and so on. Okay. Both collections are published as dumps in Zenodo, so you can download them, you can find them uh, there. And for us, it's actually important to build tools to generate and maintain, the, and maintain these dumps over time uh, out of the graph or out of our aggregation system. This is something we're working on and again, uh, may be a, a valuable, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, set of ideas for you. To, uh, so versions are, uh, should be kept and maintained over time, should be produced as much as possible incrementally and, and so on. Um, mining. Uh, we use uh, ACFS and Spark. We have th around 13 million full text, 12 to 13 millions, depending on new collections that will be included. And we use Java uh, Python framework here. So you are very welcome to write this kind of uh, algorithms. Taking into account, you will access uh, um, in parallel uh, full text related with the article and uh, you'll be able to apply algorithms on top of that according to these two uh, programming languages. Here you have a list of ideas um, that you can uh, take inspiration from, so uh, every time you will find one of those gray boxes basically you may have a few hints and then of course try to build on top of it uh, your own uh, concept. Uh, Important, important to know is that we apply content pr propagate, context propagation in the graph. So we exploit the links to propagate information from objects to objects, okay? So uh, just one example for you, if you take a look at the top, 
If I know that a product was funded by a project and I know that the product was supplemented by another product, for example, the publications to a data set, then I can easily propagate the link to the project uh, to the second product. This means that uh, when I will do my research impact from the project point of view, I will visualize a product I wasn't aware of, which is the research data in this case, for example, and uh, this will give me extra content. Of course, I would like the data source that contains this uh, second product to uh, include the link to the project, and, and that's, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, another uh, important aspect in our uh, mission. So these are examples of propagations like country and community can be propagated across the different products. For the duplications, we have two articles. You can find the references here. Um, and uh, there are several things, several, uh, let's say, actions that we may take, like in improving uh, results by adding context, which context that can be inferred from the web, for example. So any ideas in this direction are welcome. So if today you go to uh, our um, explore.openair.eu, you will find the current production system, which uh, includes only the open access subset of the graph that I, uh, that I mentioned. If you instead go to the beta.explore.openair.eu, uh, you will find a full graph, which will be open uh, soon for open consultation. Okay, uh, these are the numbers uh, inside. So any welcome will be uh, any feedback would be welcome. How to access services? Um, so we have develop, develop.openair.eu. From there, you'll be able to download uh, the data or uh, query the graph according to different, uh, different um, protocols. Uh, we are in the process of publishing the whole dump of the beta graph. Uh, so in the next month, this should be uh, available. These are quite standard ways of accessing services. So you should be uh, should you find it easy, please refer to us. DOI Boost is what I mentioned before. You can find it uh, uh, in the Zenodo online and the same for Skull Explorer. So these slides are here for your benefit. The graph will be opened uh, for consultation in November uh, and uh, be released at the end of December, probably beginning of July. So you'll find uh, Trello as a tool to uh, provide us feedback with. We, we, we will open it probably next week, okay? This week, next week. Uh, the problem of identifying errors and inconsistencies in the graph is actually key. So if you have in mind strategies to do that in an automated way, because with Trello, of course, we are collecting feedback from users, but uh, one of our uh, ideas would also be the one of analyzing the graph and automatically identifying uh, issues, for example, and then uh, provide users with uh, prompting the users with questions like um, is this really an issue or not so every strategy or technique that you have in mind that can be uh, easily reused in this context are more than welcome now uh, Natalia mentioned already uh, our standalone services and I go quickly through this Skull Explorer is certainly one of those we are collecting links using a standard that is called Skolix that we have devised together with other partners uh, in worldwide, including Datasite, Elsevier, and so on. Scolix is, a, is a basically a simple, uh, um, say, data model and uh, exchange format uh, that allows to express links between publications and data sets, data and data sets, and so on. So um, today, we are collecting a huge amount of links from uh, the sources that you see below, plus others like data uh, centers that are not uh, included in data site but are compliant to Scolix, for example. And we are offering to uh, a number of consumers via APIs. The APIs are open. Our main consumer is Scopus, in fact. Um, and of course, also the web user interface, but that's really less useful, it's more for checking that something exists in there. We uh, go up to an average of 40 million hits per month, so it's pretty big. Um, Zenodo was mentioned. Zenodo is actually a catch-all uh, catch data, uh, sorry, catch-all repository, so you can store any kind of product in there. But the, the uh, cool thing about Zenodo is uh, its APIs. So its APIs are open. So as long as you have a token, you have a user, you can uh, 
um, make you can make sure that your service is breached to Zenodo and published products on demand. So they take a DOI, you can provide the metadata and so on. So uh, applications, clever applications that do actions such as publishing on behalf of the scientist can be built uh, thanks to Zenodo. Okay, so it's very important for you to know. Um, Argos, uh, I'll skip on that. You, will, you can find information on the internet, but anyway, it's the machine actionable data management planning. Uh, it's powered by an open source, uh, an open source software called OpenDMP that we developed. And uh, it, the concept is that of machine actionable data management, so plans. So um, if you want to have more information, you can contact me here. Amnesia is a service for the anonymization of data, sensitive, sensitive data, which we are using in several contexts. You can download it and use it on your site. Now, uh, let's go to this uh, high level view. We have the open air resource graph. And as I mentioned before, we provide what we call dashboards on top. So a monitor and connect and then explore. Monitor is really about using the graph to monitor research impact trends, for example, open science trends uh, or funding trends, institutional trends and so on. Um, connect is instead more about sharing. So here is where a scientific community finds the tool to uh, discover and access uh, all um, scientific outcome in a specific uh, discipline uh, and domain. Uh, so here, what is very welcome are tools uh, on the side of monitor, tools to uh, better perform uh, monitoring operations or to use the graph, for example, to recommend uh, something to uh, the uh, uh, research administrators, for example, project coordinators and so on. On the side of Connect, it's actually very important to enrich the graph, for example, to improve the quality and the precision and recall of searches or device tools, for example, to uh, uh, search in a way that is, let's say, uh, intent driven or um, discipline specific and so on. So semantic search concepts and so on. Um, provide is the first of these dashboard is the one that we use uh, to uh, register services, uh, allow their validation um, and uh, send notifications to the original sources. Like, uh, for example, we found an enrichment for your data and so on. Um, the one of the most important services we provide is broker. This is the broker here, and as I mentioned before, uh, is the simple idea that since we are collecting metadata from uh, sources and we put them in a graph, in the context of the graph, we can um, interlink these original records or uh, clean them or enrich them uh, thanks to our tooling, and therefore it's pretty easy for us since we we keep provenance of every single record to um, track down what's new with respect to the record and who provided it. So these new bits can be sent back to the original sources. So original sources can subscribe, for example, to the open air broker and say, um, please give me all the new open, open access URLs you find about my records, or give me the ORCID IDs of the users that I have, or give me the DOI of my records if you find one, and, and so on. Uh, the user statistics service instead is, um, uh, if you're familiar with this kind of aspects, is the implementation uh, of a service that aggregates uh, user statistics about the individual uh, objects, publications in this case, across repositories. So repositories uh, participating to this uh, framework and scheme are capable of tracking down events regarding, for example, the download or the view of a record of a given uh, publication and send this information, these events to this original, uh, to this central uh, aggregator of events. He uses statistics service that uh, can uh, aggregate this information and provide um, a unified view. So you can actually see uh, how many uh, time an object has been accessed across different objects, across different sources uh, in one source or uh, the sum of all of those. So these, uh, these numbers are typically used to uh, 
as indicators of quality of you know, of, of given articles or for example the different sources so how how much they've been used compared to others um, let's go to again to the broker so topics topics uh, are produced uh, for specific data sources so whenever open air produces a topic it's um, about a target repository, about a specific object in that repository. Um, the topic is, of course, assigned, uh, it gives a message. For example, uh, I have enriched uh, with an abstract uh, uh, this record and includes a level of trust. So the original source can actually subscribe to a kind of topic and say, give me all topics uh, that have a given level of trust, for example, and whose message respects certain criteria. So this is kind of uh, fine grain uh, configurations that we can provide. Uh, we have three kinds of events, enrichments, additions, and alerts. We are only pr producing enrichments today. Um, enrichments are, again, as I mentioned before, ways to uh, complete the original records with information that wasn't present uh, in the beginning. Okay, Additions uh, are not yet produced. But of course, ways of doing the, of doing it are welcome. So we want to tell a data source when we have found a record that should be in the data source but is not present today. So there are ways of doing this, deducing it from authors. If you can identify a sort of strong relationship between an author and a repository, like its repository of reference, if you can infer it from, from the graph itself or from a statement that you can find somewhere uh, online, for example, from the affiliations, etc. Alerts are uh, more of the kind, this record has a mistake. And uh, there are several ways of producing them. We have some uh, on our roadmap. Uh, for example, it, through the OEIPMH uh, data collection, if we find an XML error, we can actually point the original repository to that as a notification um, with a notification or um, if a user comes and uh, tells us that a given link is wrong then we can of course or a given field is wrong we can of course alert the original source this is on the roadmap we haven't yet produced it so this is just a page that exemplifies how an original record that we collected from CLO in this case no sorry from La Referencia which is uh, the south um, is the Latin America aggregator uh, is enriched on the side of uh, open air via uh, se through several uh, pieces of information uh, ranging from different ways from this can be downloaded from uh, the funding um, the subjects uh, re related research results and so on these are just examples metrics uh, we use uh, sushi uh, as uh, as a way, as a mechanism, as a standard open source software, in fact, to to collect uh, information, um, it's uh, we we had to change a few of the aspects there. Um, so more information can be found on the Open Air website, and you can ask us directly. Uh, but anyway, these are the key elements, and you can find information uh, again on the website on how to hook. Uh, uh, a data source uh, to our uh, user statistic framework. So here are the links. Okay. Um, finally, just a few words on uh, what we uh, have built as Connect. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit out of time, but it's going to take another uh, four minutes. Uh, out of the graph, we can view the graph basically uh, through the eye of a given community, a scientific community. So we build this uh, service that is called Research Community Dashboard, through which on demand we can produce what we call a community gateway. A community ga gateway looks like um, uh, the uh, applications that you see uh, top left. It's basically a view over the graph, and this view can be configured, fine-tuned by the community manager, which is an authorized user. So the, 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 the girl there can configure the criteria of inclusion into the gateway of the different objects uh, of the graph. And um, uh, we have several uh, community gateways that have been generated today. Others may be uh, generated, of course, in the future. Uh, the idea is that you can specify the subjects of pertinence, so for example, of objects, so objects 
with a given subject can belong to the gateway, the provenance, uh, so if the object comes from a source or if the object comes from a given community in Zenodo, community in Zenodo are like collections often defined by scientists and communities, uh, the projects that are relative to a community, so all objects related with these projects will be included in the, in the gateway, and uh, we also propagate the, 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 the notion of a uh, link to a community via uh, the relationships, as I mentioned before, and here are two examples. So this is again to highlight the fact that you can uh, in, enhance the graph or suggest ways to uh, uh, in, in make this criteria better or um, let's say adaptable, much more and uh, better adaptable to the communities. New criteria can be via ORCIDs or others, again. Uh, monitor, instead, is a way to look at the graph from the perspective that are mentioned here. So from the funding impact point of view, ability to, uh, to attract funds, uh, forms of open science impact, which can range from fairness, fairness of software, fairness of data, fairness of whatever you want to be fair. Uh, so any suggestions in this direction are very welcome, like new measures, new indicators that can be calculated, or new ways to enrich the monitoring tools that we have uh, uh, to better capture the quality, the trend, uh, the ability to stick to the uh, open access mandates, for example, uh, in the context of uh, open air. Um, here are just examples, as I mentioned before, and uh, you can find more and more suggestions here. Um, finally, well, this is the discovery portal. As you can see, as I mentioned before, this is the production, but you can find the uh, beta service as well with the uh, extra content that I just mentioned and that will be open for consultation. So uh, thank you. Happy to reply to your questions now and in the next days. So if you want to send me an email, if you want to have more information uh, on any of the services that I presented, uh, you're welcome. As you can see, there are so many, so uh, it's really hard to have an overview in 40 minutes. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much, Paolo, for these detailed uh, presentations. There are already some questions from the participants, so um, I can transfer them to you. The first one, have you got registries for all kinds of objects, product, funder, etc.? Yes, we include, well, of course, we, uh, we include the registries uh, that uh, we believe are interesting for us. In this case, ORCID for sure, uh, grid.ac for organizations, so we easily we can have it. Uh, uh, what else? The registries of the data sources for us are very important, open door and re data, because we don't want to build yet another one unless it's very, very necessary, because this is key. Um, we have an idea of uh, uh, building uh, a new uh, registry for uh, uh, data sources if the current registries, for example, won't be able to stand to, uh, to uh, our requirements. Um, yes, in general, these are the registries that we are considering today. ORCID, of course. Okay, thank you. Second one, uh, how do you support consistency of the data in registries? We rely on registries, so they should be in charge of consistencies. Uh, when we collect from different registries, and this is the case, in several cases we deduplicate. So we build, we build internal, let's say, bridges between the different registries. Uh, this is, of course, uh, an issue. So in some cases, we are taking specific actions. Um, it's an issue because uh, every time we uh, run a deduplication process, we introduce uh, a level of uh, doubt on what we are doing. And this should be itself curated. So it's a sort of extra registry on top. So we can afford that for everything, of course. Uh, we are in the process today to develop one for organizations because we really need to have our uh, organization information stable and stabilized in the context of open air if we want to provide, uh, for example, statistics about them. So once we produce, uh, uh, once we deduplicate uh, this information, which we collect from grid.ac, but we collect it from every funder, 
has its own uh, identifier for the different organizations. In some cases, there is no identifier at all, like in Open Door and Rethree Data, they have organizations, but they don't provide specific IDs. So whenever we find a result of the duplication that is useful to us, we notify it internally and we have curators that make sure that uh, this is really the case. And if this is the case, this is uh, stabilized. So it means that for us, it becomes authoritative. So the way these uh, different entities are linked together. And this creates a more stable environment. So this is under the implementation, under implementation now, will be released hopefully beginning next year. Uh, what about the registry for organizations? They're asking. That's what I said. No. Uh, okay. So we consider this. And uh, uh, one question from Emily: Is there more information on the trust level? Well, we uh, we make sure that every time we collect uh, information or we produce information, we assign. Uh, a level of trust. So this is available in the records. So you, if you download our records, every records will 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 have inside uh, this information when is needed. So uh, the, how we assign it uh, depends on the quality of the original data source, uh, if it's a user providing it, if it's an algorithm providing it, and so on. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by more information, but uh, that's uh, what we have. So if you go to the, uh, for example, to the website and you find, uh, you open any of the uh, products, if, if this product has a link to another one that was inferred, you will find on the right, uh, um, a, let's say a bar saying how trustful this information is, like 89%, 90%, uh, et cetera, okay? So you can also find the visualization of the trust. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, the participants if uh, they have uh, other questions and also the, the technical experts if they have additional comments on the presentations. Okay, I guess that this is a no. Um, can you can you see my screen? Uh, the agenda is on it. Yes. Okay, thank you. So maybe I will proceed with uh, some uh, points uh, related to the Open Air Advance Open Call for Tenders, and after uh, uh, the end of this. Um, a small presentation. If there are other questions, maybe we can um, uh, provide the, the participants with um, the related, uh, the respective answers. Okay, so uh, regarding the framework of the updated uh, Open Air Advance Opel Core for Tenders, um, this is still split into three phases. Phase one is about uh, solution design. Phase two is about prototyping, and uh, phase three um, is about the original development and testing of um, a limited set of first products. Uh, we decided to keep this uh, phased approach because it um, allows successful contractors to improve their offers for uh, the next phase based on lessons learned and feedback from uh, the procurer in the previous phases. And uh, using a phased approach with uh, gradually growing uh, contract sizes per phase also makes it easier for smaller companies to participate in the open call and uh, enables SMEs to grow their business step by step um, with uh, its phase. Uh, so we believe that it's better to keep this scheme. Uh, second point, the maximum budget per tender will be 60K and only one topic can be chosen. That means that among the three ones that were presented, um, each participant will have to choose the one that um, it suits better to uh, their activities. 
Uh, this time there is a threshold of uh, up to 15 points uh, with the highest score of this one of 30 points. That means that uh, each applicant with a score less than 15, meaning 14, 13, 12, etc., is going to be rejected. Uh, there is also a, fl a flat rate uh, for each phase, 10% um, for phase one, 40% for phase two. Uh, English is uh, the language of the tender, uh, both for um, the communication among the procurement and the participants and the mentors. Also, all communications and submissions must be in English, deliverables and milestones. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, I said before, uh, the, the open call is expected to be published mid-November uh, on uh, the official website of the project. Uh, there you will find uh, during the next days as well the, the webinar, um, the open market consultation that we delivered today and uh, the presentations of, the, of our technical experts. And of course, uh, after the publication of the open call, you will have some time to address your questions at the openair at coralia.org. Uh, if you need clarifications or uh, if you have any other remarks, we will be um, happy to, to provide you with answers because uh, the open call is expected to be online for uh, 30 days. So you'll ha you will have some time to, some, you will have time to uh, send you questions and you, we will provide you with um, clarifications. Uh, so these are the points from my side. Uh, I would like to ask you one more if there are other questions or you need something either from me or the presenters. Mm, there is one question. Can multiple independent proposals be sent by the same company? Hmm. Well, this is uh, an issue that we've, uh, we have already experienced. Um, and is a contractor from non-EC uh, country eligible for the tender? Uh, by saying EC country, uh, you, you mean European Union, I believe. So, um, regarding the second question, <clears throat> we accept proposals from um, EU member countries and also from associated countries according to the Horizon 2020 list of associated countries. I'm sorry. <coughs> and um, regarding the first question, okay. Um, this is uh, an issue that uh, we are we are still uh, trying to decide. So I believe that you will have the, our official answer upon the publication of the open call. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, your um, participation. Uh, if uh, there is any other comment, then I will proceed to the end of the meeting. Um, there is a, a possibility to have joint proposals this time <clears throat> by saying a band to team up with open air partners. I believe that uh, you're referring to the conflict of interest. Maybe this is the issue. So, uh, in order to answer to your question, uh, we still don't want a conflict of interest. Um, 
that means that uh, uh, you you are uh, able to submit joint proposals. However, we think uh, we still think that um, we don't we don't want um, participants that have already received funding from previous uh, open air calls. Uh, however, uh, I will have to say to you that the official rules uh, are still um, under, let's say, fin fin finalization. So, upon the publication of the official call, uh, you will see that um, which is the final decision of uh, the Open Air Advance Team. However, we're proceeding to this uh, path at this moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can still address your questions at openair.coralia.org. And uh, thank you again for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you all.